project started um, with a conversation that Rob and I had in uh, Tate Modern actually a year ago. Um, he told me about this work he'd been doing on um, visualizations of molecules, molecular dynamics, and um, his collaboration with um, Alex um, making uh, sonifications of the molecules. And um, as a composer, I was really fascinated and interested in what they were doing and I wanted to be involved. The music isn't simply an independent work of art it's, and it's not free to go wherever it wants to go. It has to follow to a certain extent the data uh, which Rob provided me with. So, um, and if I don't do that, if I'm not faithful to the data in that way, then of course the, the music is not really doing its job in, in the context. So that's been a really interesting um, mediation that I've had to do to find ways in which the music can both be interesting um, and nice to listen to but at the same time it really does in some way rep represent the underlying molecular dynamics which we're trying to represent. challenges that uh, we have that that scientists have in general is coming up with compelling ways to communicate this data that they you know slave over all the time um, coming up with compelling ways to communicate the content and the significance of it and so I think you know any sort of um, a, 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 any sort of alternative sort of strategy for coming up with ways of reinterpreting that data in order to communicate it I think help can help scientists understand what they're doing better also I think it, by drawing artists into a conversation it can help scientists see the data in new ways but I also think it's it's really an 
you know, with the incredible amount of, with the huge volumes of data that are being produced, I think it's interesting to think about that data, which is a source of so much in our lives, as also a potential tap to enable artistic expression. I think that's a fundamentally interesting thing. It's quite a complicated project, lots of disparate moving parts. Um, it can be quite hard to sort of convey all that information. We've been talking about this material for months now and George has been sort of outlining some of his ideas, but it's all been in the abstract, you know. Um, so I can been able to imagine what some of it might sound like, um, but actually hearing it played in person is like a totally new experience. Had me jump it up and down the first time I heard it, it was awesome. Uh, so well done, George. <laughs> well, I've listened to them rehearse all day and that piece is difficult. <laughs> and I thought they were really amazing. Um, really on it and I love the kind of raw feeling, uh, the raw sound that you get from being right up close to a real professional string quartet. Articulation as well that uh, when if we've got quavers we could lift a bit like dum yum yeah 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 uh, welcome to Metastated Impressions, uh, Artistic Representations of Molecular Dynamics. This is a project that uh, a group of us have been working on, kindly funded by the Gene Goldman Institute. And it's a, comp uh, it's a kind of combination of classical composition, fine art, uh, deep learning, uh, sonification, and uh, chemistry. So, hope you all enjoy that. And at the end of uh, there's going to be some talks, and at the end, there's going to be a performance by the Getty Project. So, just to briefly uh, introduce the team, um, Dr. Pete Bennett is the team leader uh, at the back over there. Uh, Dr. George Holloway is the composer uh, at the back. Um, I'm Rob Arben, I've been doing the visualizations and the modeling. And Alex Jones, uh, at the back there waving, is uh, going to be talking about in the process of sonification. And um, we're going to be using a, a very large data set that was made available uh, by Rafal and John Tadera. Um, I'll talk more, a bit more about their involvement. Um, so if you're, if you're on Twitter, hello, you probably can't see me, but uh, yeah. So there's going to be three mercifully brief talks. Uh, one by me, talking about the kind of chemistry and the visualizations and the, the setup behind the project. And Alex Jones is going to talk about the, his sonification. And then George Holloway is going to talk about his composition. And then we're going to hear the composition, Metastable, by George Holloway, performed by the Legetti Quartet. So we've been. Um, uh, we, 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 we've been. Take, uh, we've been taken a huge data set uh, from a recent paper. Uh, the catchy title is Dynamic Conformational Landscape of the Protein Methyl Transferase SETD8. And I will not be explaining any of that data. Um, <laughs> but uh, I thought I'd better put the title of the paper there, seeing as uh, some people might want to Google it. Um, and the uh, huge numbers of authors that were involved in the project. Um, it's a really great paper for the chemistry nerds um, and for the chemistry the non-chemistry nerds, um, is there also if you want to. With caution. So, uh, John Chidera and Rafael um, Riera were um, a part of a, a huge collaboration called Fogging at Home. And what they do is they harness the power of uh, 
machines, your machine, you can be part of it, uh, to compute um, how proteins uh, move. It's a huge uh, process by which they uh, link up thousands and thousands of computers and run short snippets of how a protein evolves through time. And um, then, they, then they collect all that data and um, they plonk it on servers and then they analyze it. And so that's the folding at home project in, in a nutshell. And um, I'm just going to show you, so this, this protein SETD8, which is shown up here, this blog, um, this is just a short, uh, a short snippet of um, what you would typically compute on your local, on your home machine, if you were part of this project. And this generates a huge amount of data. So if you were to watch all of the data at that frame rate for, um, uh, for a full-time job, it would take you about three and a half weeks to get through all of it. So it's a huge amount of data, and um, we want to be able to make sense of that data. So uh, one of the ways we try to make sense of that is through modeling it as a uh, what's called a metastable uh, dynamical process. And um, what that essentially is, is that we can think of a protein as um, wandering around on a kind of surface, and this is this surface shown here, and it's making um, little excursions on this surface, and every time it gets into a local kind of well on that surface, it stays there for a little time, and then it moves on uh, and adopts a new kind of uh, shape, a new, different, uh, like new conformation. And uh, this is what's known as metastable dynamics, this process whereby a protein will adopt a conformation, it will wiggle and jiggle around in that kind of conformation, that place on that image, on that surface, and then it will move on a short time later. And um, you can see I put uh, two different uh, what we call conformations of the protein. So there's a, down at the bottom there, it's got this kind of tail that's coming out of it, and that might be one that the place uh, that might be one place on the uh, on the surface. And then in the top right hand corner, you've got another very distinct conformation, um, and uh, that's perhaps a, a, a well at the top right hand corner. And the reason why we care about this is because each of those uh, metastable conformations um, has a different um, function of the protein associated with it. And um, the way that we want to think about this is that we have a lot of seen information. The seen or observed information is the, is the frames of the um, of the simulation. That's the data that we that we drag down off all of those computers. <coughs> and that can be represented by the um, by the uh, snapshots the, along the bottom there. So we can see this is evolving in time, so from the left, um, you know, a short a fraction of a, a millisecond later it will adopt another confirmation, a fraction of a millisecond later it will adopt another confirmation. And there that, that's the observed information. But behind that there's an abstraction. And that's the abstraction that we really want to access. And that abstraction is called a hidden state, or a metastable state. And that's represented by the green, green blobs at the top. And we can label those, those hidden, uh, hidden states, metastable states. I've labeled them just arbitrarily 1, 2, 5, and 2. There's no meaning to that. Just, it's just a way of emphasizing the abstract nature of the information that we want to, to glean from this model, uh, from this data. And in this, in this project, we have been focusing on uh, two aspects of the modeling process. We've asked ourselves, if we take a model of this data and we abstract out these hidden states, we want to know two things about those hidden states. We want to know how stable they are, if we have a confirmation uh, that's, um, that allows a drug molecule to enter the, to the protein, we want to know how stable that conformation is, because that will tell us how effective our drug is going to be. Um, uh, but we also, and, and the way we measure that is something called uh, free energy, and we'll uh, 
George and Alex, maybe we'll talk about uh, more about the free energy later. But we also want to know how well we can classify each of the observed pieces of information as a hidden, uh, as a hidden state. So we've got this idea of certainty or uncertainty. And that's where we say, if we take a, a, a given confirmation, so in the, in, the, in the snapshot in the middle, there's just a given one single confirmation of the molecule, of the protein. And we've got to ask ourselves, does it belong to state one, or does it belong to state two? And, you know, on the left-hand side, we've got, a, we've got a bundle of different confirmations, all slightly different, and they all belong to state one. And then on the right-hand side, we've got a bundle of confirmations, and they all belong to state two. We know that for certain. But all the time we've got to be asking ourselves, for any given confirmation, how well can we classify that as either state one or state two? And so that's uh, something called the um, information entropy, or the Shannon entropy. And that's completely, well, that's a bit different to the kind of physical chemistry uh, idea of entropy, which some of you may be uh, familiar with. So that, that's, the, that's the two main things. We're interested in the stability or the free energy of, of, a, of, a, hidden, of a hidden state, a metastable state. And we're interested in how certain we can ascribe uh, a given confirmation to that uh, hidden state. So as I said, Alex and uh, George are going to talk about um, how they've used those ideas of free energy and uh, entropy to inform their sonification. Uh, and, the, uh, and the composition. But I'm going to talk about um, how we represent this, how we represent the given confirmations. And um, I've got three different pictures here. On the left is a physical model made by um, Nobel Prize winner, a uh, uh, chap called Kendrew. And he made this molecule, uh, he made this um, uh, model of, I forgot which protein it is on. But that's a kind of 3D physical model that he made. And now, and this, this was back in the 60s. And now, of course, we do it all on the computer. And we've got kind of two different representations here. In the middle, we've got a, a cartoon, a so called cartoon representation. And we've also got a representation that shows all the kind of atoms. And the point about this is that they're all very different representations. And each of them tells us something slightly different. So on the left-hand side, that representation gives us a real a kind of tactile, physical um, understanding of the, the, the protein. In the middle, the cartoon representation, that tells us something about what we call um, the secondary structure of the molecule. Those are the kind of, the, the kind of uh, twists and the, uh, and the arrows. And then on the right-hand side, we've got this um, molecule that renders all the atoms and the colours represent the different, uh, different atoms, different types of atoms. And so they each tell us something different. They're all equally as correct as each other or e as equally as wrong as each other. And so this gives us a, a great degree of freedom about how we represent these things. Um, so this is kind of leading on to the first um, part of this project, which was, can we come up with a way of uh, representing these molecules that combines um, elements from um, fine art and also elements from the from the, the protein representation. And the way we did this was by actually harnessing uh, the power of deep learning for image classification. And image classification uh, is um, uh, accomplished now by uh, deep um, deep neural networks, convolutional neural networks. And there's a schematic of, of, of one up there called um, uh, Inception. Um, it's made by Google. And essentially each of, those, each of those blobs up there is a mathematical operation. And an image is just a kind of um, array of numbers. And so it's amenable to be um, kind of manipulated by um, you know, mathematical algorithms. And so what you do is you put your image in one end, and out pop, and at the other end, it gives you a probability of being a certain thing. For example, it's able to tell um, the difference between two different breeds of husky. 
And so within uh, these, these models are typically trained on a huge amount of data. And they contain um, huge amounts of information about what images are, how they're how they um, how different images are different from each other. And what this has allowed us uh, researchers to do is to ask ourselves what, what is this information in these neural networks? And how can we um, how can we decipher what all these all this information is? Typically, these neural networks contain billions of, of parameters which are learned. And so, making sense of them is, is a really difficult task. And uh, what a, uh, a few years ago, back in I think 2015, um, some researchers asked themselves, what is the style of an image? Can we use a neural network to understand what the style of an image is? And that style is a kind of a broad term. It could mean it's not just brush strokes or composition, it's a, it's a wide variety of things. And so, um, this, this idea of uh, extracting style became quite popular because it was a way of understanding what neural networks see and, and, and how they work. And so what I want to show you, I'm not going to go into how exactly it works, but uh, what I want to show you is the top left hand corner, there's a picture called by uh, Boucher, um, and it depicts Jupiter, um, as, uh, as Diana and a nymph, and they're cavorting. And um, as, uh, as, as these images go across, we're taking different, um, we're, un we're trying to see what that neural network thinks of as a style in different points in the network. So, for example, you know, you could maybe ask yourself in one of those blue blobs, at that point, in this whole process of classifying the image, what does it think of as style? And then you might ask yourself, what you know, a blue blob a bit further down, what does that uh, think of as style? And so I created these images, um, which are looking at different layers within uh, the neural network, and, are, and I'm asking the neural network, what do you think the style of that painting is? And as you can see, as you go through the network, um, it in the, in, the first, uh, in the first layer there, it picks up small brush strokes. In the second layer, it starts to pick up um, more kind of uh, smaller scale features. In the bottom layers here, you can start to see kind of the, the limbs and the trees and the leaves. And these are larger scale stylistic features. Okay? And so this is what it's thinking of when this neural network, when it's thinking of, of, this, of this image. And so what you can do is you can use this neural network to blend different images. You can take an image and you can say, I want the style of that image, but I want to apply it as though uh, I want to apply it to a different image. So what I've done here is I've taken on the right hand side, I've taken the, the, the Boucher uh, image. And in the middle, I've taken a representation of a protein, our protein that we're studying. And on the left-hand side, I've combined the style of the Boucher. I've put it, and I've put that style onto the rendering of the protein. And on the left, you can see that. So you can see, you know, elements, you can see um, the belly button of Callisto in, in certain uh, blobs on the, on the, on the protein. And so this was a way of, you know, combining style from uh, different paintings throughout history onto different representations of proteins. And we thought this was kind of neat. Um, this is an idea that actually Dave Gawacki in the front row there uh, suggested to me a long while back, and we bashed our heads trying to get it to work, trying to get it to work, and eventually we did. Um, and so that leads us to the kind of the idea behind this this project. We wanted to um, sonify a molecular dynamics trajectory. A trajectory is just a, an evolution of the protein through time. And we wanted to bring out um, the different metastable states that it, it, it 
it brings up as it evolves through time. And we wanted to also combine, we wanted to also you know, convey um, the idea that um, our discoveries, our, our knowledge of proteins is actually built up of uh, a long timeline of discoveries from different people. And so we came up with this idea of transferring styles from different um, artists throughout time and applying them to renderings of the protein. And we wanted that to coincide with uh, significant points in the history of the development of the thought of proteins and science in general. And then my friend and composer George, George Holloway suggested that why, don't, why doesn't he also write a string quartet to go along with that, which would be a kind of sonification uh, or a loose sonification of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the protein. And so it made sense for us to combine musical elements from around the time of uh, the different time points in history where we were, we were taking our source material. So I'm going to go, so the, the final uh, piece is in five movements, and we've chosen five points in time which we think were significant for the development of science and for proteins, and for modeling proteins. And this is going to inform the structure of the, uh, of the piece. So um, I'm just going to go through these five uh, pieces now, these five timelines, so just to explain a little bit about it, and then I'm going to hand over to Alex, who's going to talk about his more abstract and some application. So the first time period and the first movement is to do with, um, with a kind of medieval period and we picked Roger Bacon because Roger Bacon was one of the first people to really codify an idea of um, theory and experiment and some people call him you know, the grandfather of the scientific method. And so we've got Roger Bacon on the left, and so there's a nice quote from him. Uh, Reasoning draws a conclusion that does not make the conclusion certain unless the mind discovers it by the path of experience. That is, we can think about things, we can philosophize, but we really need to check it against experimental data. And in the middle there is um, Godric of Finchale. Finchale. Uh, he was a composer, and um, we're going to use some of his... Um, music in the, the final string quartet. And then the artistic element that we, we decided to, to take for this period is an image from uh, an illumination from the Queen Mary Psalter. So Queen Mary uh, was in the 16th century, but actually this Psalter was um, uh, authored in, around the 1300s. And a Psalter is, is a collection of the biblical psalms, if anyone's not aware. The second movement we've uh, taken for our scientific inspiration, uh, Robert Cook on the left, and our, our, our kind of artistic style, uh, we've taken a picture from his um, Micrographia book, um, it's just a flea there. The Micrographia was one of the first uh, times that members of the public could uh, take images of, uh, see images of things that they were never able to see with the naked eye, because he use the microscope. Uh, so we think that's pretty significant. We're probing beyond what we can see with our own eyes. And around that time in England, um, Henry Purcell was probably the most famous composer, so we're using uh, material from, from Purcell. So from the 1700s, we um, decided to choose uh, P.S. Uh, Simon Laplace. Laplace was one of the founders of Kind of modern statistical theory, as well as a lot of other um, mathematical developments. Um, and for our artistic uh, style, we decided to use Francois Boucher, which I've been showing you all along. And for so Laplace and Boucher were all from France, and um, the most preeminent um, composer at that time was uh, Jean Philippe Rameau. So we're going to be using his music. In the third, third piece, third movement. And from the, art, uh, the 1800s, um, our, our um, scientific inspiration is Andre Markov. 
Andrei Markov um, developed the notion um, of, well, he developed the underlying theory that allowed us to model these proteins in the first place. Um, so he was a Russian, so we've moved in, from, from um, France to Russia in the 1800s, and um, for our uh, artistic inspiration, we're going to be using a painting called Sadko by Ilya Rapin, and this depicts a, um, a famous merchant at the time um, going into some kind of underworld, um, so underwater, underwater world, uh, it's based on a poem. And then for the musical uh, inspiration we're going to be using material from Modesk uh, Mozorsky. And in the 1900s, uh, there were so many scientific developments that we just decided to list a, a bunch of them. So Frederick Sanger uh, was the first person to uh, discover the sequence of a protein. Ulam, uh, Fermi, Pastard, Singu uh, were the first people to do what's called a Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation. Um, and that's, that was using ideas from Andre Markov. Um, it's kind of significant development. Aldrin and Weinreich, um, they were the first people to do the kind of simulation, um, it's called a molecular dynamic simulation, and they were the first people to do that. Um, so that was obviously significant. And then down at the bottom there was an acronym, it was a Bauman Petri, they were the first people to develop this idea of a hidden process, extracting hidden information from the observed process, and so HMM stands for Hidden Markov Model. Uh, so this was all in the 50s and 60s, and uh, we decided to use Jackson Pollock as a, a stylistic inspiration. And for the musical inspiration, uh, we've, we've been using uh, Morton, Morton Feldman. So that's, so that's it from me. So I'm just going to leave this playing, and while this is playing, Alex is going to come up, and uh, he's going to talk about his sonification. Thanks. What I do instead of a uh, PowerPoint presentation is to give a brief explanation of what we just saw and heard, and then rather dangerously attempt to give a live demo of, that kind of uh, maybe explicates uh, the sort of relationship between the sound and what you saw. And then I'm going to play the video again at the end to see if you can appreciate any further details that you get in the first version. So that was a the, the sonification was of the data from the hidden Markov model, which Rob was explaining in his part of the presentation. Um, and so, I think it's worth pointing out at the start that this is quite a different process to kind of creating sound for a moving image, like you might do for an animation or something like that, where you might watch the kind of movement and pick out the salient features and try to design a sound that maybe corresponds to the movement. Instead, in this case, the sound is parameterized by a statistical model which represents the metastable dynamics of the system, uh, by which I mean to say there's a complex relationship between what you see in here. It's not necessarily straightforward. Uh, and the basic idea is that you see the geometrical configuration of the molecule changing over time. And what you hear, I hope, is the transition between metastable states. Um, and something about the stability of each state while, while the protein is in it, and then also something about the degree of certainty of that assignment, because it's not always a certain thing. Remember, each state can represent a number of different configurations of the protein. Um, so, let's try it. Okay, so there are five different states in the system that we're looking at here. And each of the states is, uh, has a varying degree of stability. So I believe 
Number three and four are the most stable, and they might sound. That's number three. So what you have here is a, a certain set of notes um, that are assigned to state number three, and then the system is choosing from that from that pool of notes. And the sort of timbre and volume of the notes is parameterized by the stability of that state. So that's state number three. And then Absolute free energy, which is a byword for the stability of the molecule, um, that serves um, to modulate sort of tumble characteristics and the length of the note. So if I start playing bits and notes, that's something like what you might hear if there was a spike in the free energy. Uh, and then if there is a spike in the entropy, which represents some kind of uncertainty in the assignment to a certain state, then... So my piece is called Metastable, um, and in the next few minutes I want to uh, dis uh, discuss um, something of my 
ba uh, the background of my creative interests and what made me interested in doing this project in the first place, and then talk a little bit about uh, the way in which I um, use musical structure to represent the molecular da dynamics, and finally to talk about the relationship between the style transfer that Rob was dis um, explaining to you and my approach to musical transcription, the way in which musical styles can be um, alluded to or used in free composition. And this is the first page of the score, just so you can see what it look, roughly looks like, the piece for string quartet. Uh, recently, I've been very interested in um, combining different approaches to musical form. Um, in particular, uh, geometric and organic ideas of musical form. Uh, on the right hand side, there's a sketch from one of my pieces. I often think in terms of blocks of time and blocks of material, so a lot of my sketches look like this, sort of coloured blocks. Um, and with, with annotations about uh, instrumentation, dynamic, and, and also duration. So I, I often think in a very ge geometric way. And I conceive of this geometric way of thinking in terms of extra musical or extrinsic uh, elements being imposed or s superimposed upon the musical material. Um, which could be understood as intrinsic, um, uh, intrinsic to the music. Um, and I'm interested in playing with different temporal proportions and also uh, the difference between jump cuts where the music will suddenly change in character and through composed music where it develops in an organic and gradual way. Um, I'm also interested in combining music and video. And in the picture here you'll see this is a snapshot from a, a work which I made for um, video and ensemble. Uh, in this particular piece um, the video consists of fixed shots of um, natural scenes um, and the shot stays the same but uh, obviously the wind is blowing the flowers and the grass and the waves on the sea are constantly moving and fluctuating. So I'm interested in this idea of flux within stasis. Um, and that is how I got my imagination captured by this, this project or the, the, uh, the chemistry behind this project uh, and the idea of metastability, this word attracted me very much. The idea of something both being stable and in some way also not stable. Um, all of this began with a conversation that I had with Rob in the cafe at Tate Modern last summer when he was telling me about his work with Alex and, um, and the sonification that, that Alex was doing for Rob. And I really wanted to be involved and I really wanted to actually find a way of having real musicians, live, living musicians, uh, playing along with the visualizations. Uh, so this is, this is where it all started for me. Um, I knew that there were basically two essential requirements for the music. I knew it had to be active, constantly moving, in the same way that the protein is constantly moving on the molecular level. And it also needs to be polyphonic. That means there are lots of voices moving independently in the music. And that's because uh, in the protein simulations, as you might have just seen, uh, you'll get a kind of a tail of a few molecules kind of sticking out and wobb uh, wobbling about um, and sort of moving independently from the, the rest of the body of the protein. So I wanted to reflect that in the polyphonic nature of the music. The other requirement for the music was that I needed to find a middle ground between an independent musical piece which exists on its own and develops organically in the way I just I was describing just a few minutes ago uh, and a sonification which slavishly um, 
sticks adheres to the um, to the data which is being used. Of course, um, if it, 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 the, I knew the music couldn't be too musical in the traditional sense because then it would draw attention to its own musicality and we would end up kind of enjoying the piece of music as a piece of music and, and maybe neglecting its role as a sonifying element. Uh, but at the same time it couldn't merely be a mechanical translation of the data because that would also not be interesting um, potentially to listen to. Uh, and so there's a useful phrase in this particular, in the literature, uh, relating to this, this field called data-inspired music. Um, and that's essentially what I was trying to do with this piece, with Metastable. It's essentially um, simultaneously a sonification, but also a piece of music that can be enjoyed as well. So Rob uh, provided me with the data uh, we had 16 sample trajectories, and I chose five of those 16 trajectories to be the five movements of the piece. When Rob gave me the data, it looks like this. So uh, there are three graphs, essentially, and uh, from left to right it represents time. Um, and you can see in the top one, that's the, that shows the five states, the hidden states. Um, which I interpret as being distinct musical materials. And below it, uh, you have the Shannon entropy, uh, which is the certainty with which we know that it's in a particular state or not. And I, I, I translate that in my musical thinking into a sort of clarity of identity of the musical material. Um, and then in the uh, and then the third graph is the free energy, and that in the music is a fluctuation in the degree of tension in the music. Um, so these, the Shannon entropy and the free energy, I will explain in just a moment. Um, but one thing that struck me when I saw this graph when Rob gave it to me is how similar it is in some ways to certain graphic notations of the radical American composers of the middle of the 20th century, in particular, uh, Morton Feldman on the left here and Earl Brown on the right. And in the case of the Morton Feldman piece, you might be able to see at the top, there's a, a number next to the box, 158. That's a metronome marking. That tells you how many beats per minute this piece has to be performed at. So in a sense, this is a proportional notation that time is proportionally notated from left to right across the piece, which is exactly how the graphs were that Rob provided me with. And on the right-hand side, we have a similar kind of um, symbolic notation, uh, suggestive of the um, uh, different types of material lasting for a certain amount of time and overlapping in different ways. Uh, so that, was, that really captured my imagination when Rob gave me the uh, the data, and I, in a way, I really treated his graphs as graphic scores, the instructions of which had somehow been lost, and it was my task to back-engineer uh, back these graphic scores, decide how these graphic scores should be interpreted, and so I think this is one of the um, scores, this is the annotation for the first movement. Um, now, it was very important to me that the changes in state should be audible. And uh, I had to find ways of actually doing that, distinguishing the different states in the musical material. Uh, and that involves finding a certain balance between sameness and difference, in the sense that it's still the same molecule, it's just moved into a different state. And the musical material had, in some way, to still be the same material, but just different in a, enough for us to hear the change. Uh, and I do that by way of changes in dynamic, in other words, volume, changes in the rhythmic subdivision of the beat. Um, and you can see that actually on my, it's quite small, but on, on the top graph, on the left hand side, you might be able to make out some note values which I've written there. So the first movement, uh, the, in the first movement, the states are distinguished by different basic subdivisions of the uh, also by mode, the number of sharps or flats which are being played uh, by the instruments at any one time. Changes in register, how high or low it is. 
Um, and also in the third movement, the, uh, the Ramon piece, uh, I, I, I distinguish the states by the number of people who are playing. Um, and it's interesting, to, I'd be really interested to know uh, which of these methods, because each movement approaches it in a slightly different way, uh, you think best um, embody or convey this change of state in the music. Um, so I really invite everybody to be very open and active in um, giving us your feedback um, because this is, after all, uh, still a work in progress. Okay. Uh, just one, just a couple of last things. Um, the Shang entropy and the free energy are two aspects of the data which are very difficult to visualize. Um, and so one thing which I was very keen to do was to allow the music to uh, serve this function that the visualization can't serve so easily. So uh, in the sense of the, 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 the fluctuation in the clarity of the identity of each state, um, I try to find ways of mixing the states together. So sometimes you might hear mixes of different materials happening together. Uh, that would suggest an increase in the shaman energy. And in the case of the free energy, fluctuations in the degree of tension. And that could be dynamics. Um, there's one piece where I use dynamics to represent this. In all the other pieces, I use the change in bow position. Um, and actually, I think you'll be able to experience that for yourselves when you hear the piece, that when, when a string player changes the position of the bow on the string, there's a very dramatic change in the quality of the sound, which immediately convey something to the audience. Um, and finally, uh, I wanted to just, just, just mention the process of style transfer. In a sense, uh, I had to be my own AI. I had to be my own machine learning. Uh, in the same way that uh, Robin, producing his visuals, had to harness the power of an enormous network of computers to, to create the, um, the style transfer. Uh, I had to, in a sense, extract the style from our chosen composers and apply it to the data which Rob had supplied me with. Um, so we have this process, original object plus the style model and then the transformed object. And I wanted to share with you this, this um, um, sketch. Where, this is from the third movement, uh, from the second movement. Uh, the Henry Purcell movement. At the top, you see the two lines are the last six bars of a, a piece by Henry Purcell that called um, Fantasia, Three Parts on the Ground. And I, through progressive transformations of that original material, I found ways of um, defamiliarizing it or decontextualizing de it. And uh, the most important thing that happened during this process of course, was that the syntax, the original syntax of the music, was lost, uh, inevitably lost, uh, because the structure of the data could not possibly be reconciled with the original structure, the deep structure of the music. So what one ends up with are, to use a linguistic analogy, morphemes without the syntax or the deep structure. You have fragments of vocabulary, if you like, but none of the correct grammar or none of the correct syntax there. Um, and so it's elusive rather than a pastiche, and I hope that you will be able to get a feel for that in the performance. Um, and so in this sense, it's my, my working process was a process of transcription, transforming the found material into something new. So um, I will leave it there, and um, we now have the performance of my piece Metastable by the Liberty Quartet. Um, so please, everybody please welcome the Liberty Quartet.
Thank <laughs> you. 